Hare Krishna, Guru Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. After several months of a hiatus, I'm delighted yes. to have you. Thank you for sparing Pleasure your time once back. again. Pleasure to be back, Chaitanya Charanji. Thank you. And uh, you know, this topic list of topics you had sent was quite uh, provocatively fascinating. So yeah, lengthy, to- lengthy as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I could also say it was intellectually mouthwatering. <laughs> so today's topic, uh, that is, this is, please criticize me. That is almost the opposite of the normal human psychology. And also to some extent, quite opposite in the idea that devotees, we say should not, not criticize each other. So you know, can you explain how you came up with this topic and what are your thoughts behind it? Yes. Please criticize me, Chaitanya Charanji. I want to grow. Okay? Okay. Those two statements go together. Please criticize me. I want to grow. You know, there is that story of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati who would take a daily boat across a river. And when he got to the other end of the river, something to this effect, there was a, uh, some fellow at a distance who yelled down, you know, you sadhus, you're all, you know, fake, you know, you're not real sadhus, you know, um, you're not genuine, you know. Every day, when they cross the river, this fellow hmm. will be yelling out such things, right? And then a, one day, they were, they were about to cross. And, and uh, one of the devotees with Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati said, you know, uh, that, devote, that fellow who would criticize us, or, you know, at the, at the end of our ride, apparently he died. And he said, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I thought you'd be happy to hear that he died. No, no more criticism. He said, no, I, I needed the, I need, I depended on the criticism. He was, he was disappointed that he had passed away because he liked the criticism that, that he, that was yelled at from a distance you know, fake sadhu, no, not real sadhus, and so on. Now, I don't know that we, you know, have to exactly do that. But I sort of identify with that. I invite anyone to criticize me. I love criticisms. Because, I, why? Because I want to grow. Hmm. Okay. You know, now, yeah. just just to, if I may, okay. Yeah, you go ahead, uh, Chaitanya Charanji. If I may interrupt you, now I'm able to connect a, lot, a little more with the topic. So, I, I've been writing articles for BTG, and that was my first exposure to, like, a review board who would review the articles and give feedback. So, before that, I had published right. in some in- Indian newspapers, but even papers like Times of India, they would just give a yes or no. They would not really review the article. They either they would publish it or just tell you no. But when I saw that review, I felt actually honored that all those, all these thoughtful devotees had actually so carefully read the article and had given me some feedback for improving. And I, I learned a lot. And even now, although I'm one of the editors for BTG, I look forward to the reviews by others. Because Wonderful. exactly what you say, it helps me to grow. But at the same time, I have seen that many other aspiring authors, they, they just feel that the reviews discourage them so much that yes. they feel I should stop writing itself. And that's why they say that I'll just publish on my own blog and I won't go to this whole review process. So I right. feel that, so I was thinking about the difference. So I thought of three things and maybe you could expand. Uh, first is that, you know, how strong is one's desire to grow and improve? Hmm? Second is that how much trust does one have in that in the basically the at least the intentions of the critic? Yeah. 
if the critic critic is actually not our well wisher is trying to pull us down then it becomes even more difficult even if there is a grain of truth in that and third yes. is also how the criticism is phrased so yeah sometimes even something spoken with good intention is yes. it may come out in a way that is becomes unpalatable yeah. so those are my thoughts but i as i just thought i relate with you what you're saying and i shared that thank you yeah actually those are really helpful observations about the whole nature of of um uh, of criticism um and and criticism in the positive sense but also how criticism can be negative so i thought that was a, those are good shortcut understandings um okay. but you know i mean i uh, lately um or fairly recently i found uh, some leading devotees on dandavats uh with lectures or videos or something titled do not criticize devotees do not criticize devotees implicit in those titles chaitanya charan is a criticism that devotees are criticizing devotees so in mm. a way it's 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 sort of it, it it's simplistic to simply say don't criticize devotees and then in a way it's also uh contradictory i'm criticizing devotees anticipating that they're going to criticize devotees so the article is telling me don't criticize devotees but i i have okay. i have students i have students i criticize you know their work in the university or or um uh, uh devotee students or disciples or or um people who want to learn from me i critique things and the intent as you brought out very important chaitanya charanji if the intent is to contribute rather than to tear down to contribute then this is essential this is very important so sure. i think it's simplistic to say don't criticize now the word criticize in english does carry the the sort of um um uh, definitions or the the connotations or even denotations of you know condemn disparage um to find fault uh, which is a phrase that prabhupad will use um also for the uh, verb um uh, in sanskrit start, the verb root nind hmm. nind um that's a very strong verb uh, to to criticize to to um to blame to censure to um despise even to despise to be envious of i mean that's very powerful and in that way we don't want to criticize and it and then even just in english it has a sense of condemning or being prejudged um uh as in prejudice and these are all the negative senses of criticism and uh i would say that's how i criticize criticism okay okay so yeah. these are the things to avoid in criticism but okay, can i, I just add a, can i just add a couple of things if you don't mind in this yes please yeah so, uh -huh. yeah you know in some ways uh, i don't think i have ever given a class on avoid criticizing but i have talked about avoiding a judgmental mentality and don't be judgmental so two things i feel in more in a devotee community one is that this is not just a matter of some skill we want to improve like i want to improve my writing i want to improve my analysis this is a matter of faith and it comes much closer to the heart so it's like the the closer we cut to the nerve the more painful it is so when especially people who are venerable for us say if we have one spiritual master criticizing another spiritual master then that uh, that can shake the foundations also of the faith so i feel that uh, criticizing skills and criticizing matters of faith uh, there is a categorical difference maybe not categorical but a substantial difference and yes. and another point is that i don't know whether it is a cultural issue that long ago when uh, when there was a, a 
like a prominent criticism by one iskon leader of another iskon leader and i was i knew both of them so uh-huh. one of my spiritual guides told me that he said that this should never have been done in public he said in our culture if a uh, if the mother and father fight they never fight in front of the children so you know they will close the door they will even can tell the children to go to the neighbor's place or something like that so the conflicts will be there it can't be avoided and sometimes they as you said they are necessary to improve but i said that when such kind of criticism comes out in public then it is both damaging to the faith and it's also in some ways uh, contrary to contrary to traditional culture yeah yes yeah. i just yes please i think you know i think that's a very good point um there are times for um critique and criticism to be private no question about it but there are also times for it to be public especially oh. when people are being hurt by someone they need to see someone else coming in and speaking up for them protecting them um okay uh, so there there needs so sometimes we need to request accountability especially if others are being hurt now okay. if 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 this is a private matter and it's more you know something that that is again appropriate to to um discuss privately of course in the example of parents you know maybe disagreeing uh, perhaps um on parenting and and they can get together and talk about that that's fine i i i agree with that point but if another parent is being somewhat abusive to the children then it's possible that the children need to hear the other parent protecting them and challenging so if if there's if it's that at that level where the the children need to feel protected and need mm. to feel that that they're being stood up for then that's another thing that's a very good difference yeah you see you see that's that's important so you know the circumstances are now you know one time i was giving a lecture well i lecture you know quite a bit when when before pre covid of course up in potomac maryland this is where i met you chaitanya charanji yes i remember i was right meeting. out the front door and there you were yes right Uh, I wasn't even sure uh, who you were. We introduced ourselves to one another, and um, it was a very nice meeting. I remember that. Yeah, so, you know, I saw I was... you effulgent from the Vyasa Sen, and I thought that I have seen you, but somehow I didn't even imagine that a prominent scholar like you would be like one attendant in a Sunday fees class. Then of when course. somebody, then somebody introduced you to me, I was uh, I was overwhelmed. It was no, one of the. I... one of the pleasantest surprise of that us visit for me well i i enjoyed your class and of course i sat in your class to see if i could criticize it <laughs> okay <laughs> good one <laughs> yeah so there you go so so now the thing is this the antidote to the negative aspects of criticism is dialogue samvadam dialogue look what happened when arjuna fell into this incredible stupor of hopelessness and despair hmm krishna immediately you know criticized it look at that how terrible okay. of krishna to criticize arjuna how mean hearted how mean spirited krishna was no it wasn't because it was done in a loving and understanding way Okay so going back to the previous example they're saying if we don't criticize then it is like sweeping the problem under the car- under the rug and it will fester so whereas yes. in, in this case the dialogue so criticism is more we could say it's more you could say the courage to address the issue that yes yes imagine if krishna after arjuna dumped the contents of his shattered heart 
onto Krishna. And then Krishna, you know, went to Bhishma and said, you wouldn't believe what I just heard. Oh my God. <laughs> Arjuna is in some kind of Maya. I mean, he's terrible. He's a coward. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, right? I mean, this is this is the, the gossip issue. See, this is this is bad. No, he stayed with Arjuna and said, Arjuna, this is kind of shameful on the externally, this is shameful behavior. Internally, I understand it because you have forgotten. You have forgotten who I am, Arjuna. You have forgotten how much I love you. How much I am with you. That's why the laugh, he, uh, Prahasana, in, uh, he, he, he laughed out loud. Pra, prahasana. 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 Forward, right yeah. at the beginning of the second chapter. And yeah, it wasn't a mocking laugh. It was a laugh of a parent for a child who was hurt and crying, but crying needlessly. Crying needlessly. Needlessly, yes. And the parent sometimes goes like, oh, oh, oh I'm just, you know, there's a laugh, but it's not a mocking laugh. It's a loving laugh. You know, when you understand, you will laugh too, you know, that kind of thing. It was a loving laugh. So again, context, intention is so important, as you have just said. So, you know, one time I was lecturing in the temple up in Potomac. Hmm. That, that temple fits at least 300 people, you know, when it's a crowded day. You've seen. Yeah. And I said at the end, any comments or questions? Well, there were a, a couple. Uh, there are always comments and questions uh, uh, when I lecture, probably because people have criticisms or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, the dialogue is always lively. But one brahmachari actually stood up. He's, he, he's, most of the people who inquire, they sit down, they have the microphone, remember? But this brahmachari, from somewhere else, I don't know who he was, he stands up with the microphone and he says, Garuda Prabhu, why have you published, translated and published your own Bhagavad Gita? When your spiritual master has already done this, I feel this is a great offense to your spiritual master. And I feel it's very misleading to other devotees as a senior uh, devotee in the movement. And he went and he was, he went on and on. Of course, the audience was looking at me like, wow. Oh my God. You know, they felt, oh my gosh, senior Prabhupada, disciple, you know, the whole thing. They were wondering, you know, but I was sitting there very intent on listening. I was drinking in all the nectar of criticism, you know? And I let him speak as long as he wanted to. I did not interrupt. When he was done, I said, Chaitanya, Chaitanya Charan, I said, of course, the audience is very tense at this point because they don't know how I'm going to respond. So, Chaitanya Charanji, what I said first was, first of all, I, I don't know your name. So may I, may I know your name? And, and I, he told me his name. And, and I said, you're obviously traveling through, right? Because I've never met you before. And he said, yes. I said, okay, well, I'm glad to meet you, first of all. Second of all, I so much appreciate your courageous offering of your actual feelings about something that I've done, something I've produced. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that. So that requires a lot of, uh, you could say, a lot of self-confidence on your part. You are not taking the criticism personally and actually you are also lowering his defenses or lowering the temperature by all that you are saying. You know, it's, it's not oh, easy. Well. It's well, not easy to respond like that. A good, there's a good chance, Chaitanya Charanji, that I might be lowering the temperature, but I don't know yet because he might be very 
angry, you know? But, okay. and he was angry. He was angry in his first words to me as he um, uh, presented his case. But I told him, I appreciated that he had the courage to, to uh, reveal his mind and his heart to me directly, as opposed to criticizing me behind my back. Hmm. So this is and a very important topic. This is a very important point. Maybe we'll, uh, we will take this thread later also. That oh, yes. when we say that don't criticize, if there are some reservations or negativity in the heart, that is going to come out eventually as gossip or backbiting or something like that. That's right. That's so better, right. better bring it in the front and address it. That's the antidote to the negative parts of criticism. Oh, okay. In dialogue. That's the antidote to the negativity. So this is part now. Now, if I were offended, okay, offended, then, you know, then it may be, it would just worsen things. But I was not offended. In fact, I thanked him. And the third thing I thanked him for, I said, I am uh, really, um, so deeply appreciative of how protective you are being for our spiritual master's writings and his works and his teachings. Even if you're trying to protect me or protect them from me, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're being very protective of Prabhupada's work. And that is also commendable. That's amazing. I have been so last, course, last so time. So, of course, the audience, yeah. Chaitanya Charanji, the audience, of course, was so much relaxed because they saw I wasn't about to storm off the asana or, or start yelling, How dare you, you disrespectful, you know, Prabhupada Shishya Aparadi, you know, <laughs> pulling rank, <laughs> all this nonsense, right? I so much appreciated it. And, and then I said, if I may, let me share with you how I came about writing a presentation, a translation, and so on. And one of the things I asked him, I said, did you ever read my book? He said, no. He said, I just know what's there. Just knowing it's there is a great, um, uh, uh, painful, it's greatly painful for me to know just that it's there. And of course, I said to him, I said, I have never meant this work to be painful for anyone. And I apologize for that. But I think if you read what I've written, I think you'll find that everything I've done there is supportive of what Prabhupada has written. And that was my intent. And then I mentioned at the end that Prabhupada also said there could be other Bhagavad Gita's in a conversation with Pradyumna and Radhavalabha particularly. Back in the day, the devotees asked, uh, Pradyumna um, conveys this in a memory. The devotees asked Prabhupada, what will you translate in the future? He said, oh, there's so many books. There's Mahabharata, there's Ramayana, there's Bhagavad Gita. Devotees looked around. Prabhupada, haven't you already translated the Bhagavad Gita? Uh, I get, you know, they were hesitant to ask. This is like a little uncomfortable. I mean, you know. And he said, oh, yes, but there can be others. So, now, but I noticed that I saved that for last. Yeah, you know, I was just going to think about that. So what you are doing is in many ways different from what a reflexive action would be. So first yeah. is to try to def defend ourselves, try to criticize the other person. Or I read a recent uh, article. It was written by it was written by a Christian scholar. He was saying that that we shouldn't be hiding behind Jesus in our debates. Or we shouldn't be. <laughs> that's, so, very, that's very good. Same yeah. with Prabhupada. 
Yeah. Done. So that's why I presented Prabhupada last. So can you just explain uh, means how, what happens by presenting it last or first? Uh, I mean, how does that make a significant difference? Okay. It makes a significant difference in just the way you just started talking about. You know, we shouldn't hide behind Jesus, right? In other words, let's make this a heart-to-heart -heart dialogue. Let me not use Prabhupada as gaining authenticity or gaining uh, permission. Um, we can certainly bring that in, but make this a heart-to-heart -heart transaction. So he expressed to me his misgivings. I expressed to him my appreciations for what he was doing. Then we engaged in some greater understanding between the two of us. And by the way, Prabhupada says this. Okay. So if you bring in Prabhupada first, then it is more of, there is no, there, there may not be so much of a heart to heart connection because then it, it becomes more of a intellectual defense rather than a personal reciprocation. Exactly. So, okay. So let's say this uh, devotee got up and did everything he, I told you he said, and then um, without giving you all the details, but you know, he gets up and I, and I, and I, my response will simply be, well, you know what, uh, Prabhu, Prabhupada said this, uh, according to Praduna Prabhupada said there could be others. Okay. So deal with it. See, Beautiful, yeah. I, I'm using Prabhupada to separate me from the other devotee. That's not the way, that's not how Prabhupada should be used. Oh, so that means, you know, you thought you are on Prabhupada's side, but actually it is I who am on Prabhupada's side, and I have shown that you are not on Prabhupada's side. It becomes like Prabhupada's quotes become like a, a way to a of create, war. create a tug of war, war. yeah. Right, a tug of war. You're, you know, you've got your Prabhupada, I've got my Prabhupada, and let's pull both arms, and then that there's no point. You know, Prabhupada, I think, just to carry this point, in the Gita's 18th chapter commentary, Prabhupada writes about how uh, the spiritual master is the via medium uh, between the disciple and Krishna, and yet the experience is personal. So, yes. so it is a person heart-to-heart -heart connection between Krishna and the devotee it's, so it's so similarly if if this if you're not like the spiritual master helps us establish the connection but that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have a personal connection so you are saying that's the right. same in principle we can apply with other devotees also that's right exactly yeah beautiful it's about so again, sangha. it's a sangha it's about coming together not moving apart oh okay Sangha, coming together, literally, together, some, right? Sangha, Ga, okay. come, to come together, yeah. yeah so, now, this is also a good example of how, say, the, the criticism is what started the dialogue. Now, the criticism right. could have degenerated into a, what could be a word, it could have become like a shouting match, or it could have become a, it could have degenerated into something negative. But the way you handled it, that ensured that it became it became quite actually not only uh, it became heartwarming for everyone that's right that is correct now let's say i said to the brahmachari let's say i became indignant hmm. and i said i don't know who you are but you you are you have no right you're a junior to me you have no right to challenge me on this so please sit down or leave the temple room Wow, that would have just, whew, everyone would have felt so crushed, so alienated, so, mm, so uncomfortable. But as it was, everyone with my approach felt warmed, felt thrilled, felt lifted up all of us into a community of understanding. That's why I, I like the title, Please Criticize Me. 
I have no fears. Mm. So I want to I want to grow. Yes, bro. You know, I have the, the, the famous example in our books of the critical devotee is Ramachandra Puri. I was thinking exactly about the same thing. Right. So, right. He and he and two examples of criticizing, right? One, he criticizes the spiritual master. And yeah. the second, he criticizes his his god brother, namely Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm. So, wait, so again, so you see that that time, god brother. Wait, Ishwara Puri. Okay, wait. Yeah. So Ishwara disciple. Puri. So like his uh, next generation, basically. So yeah, Ramachandra. So Madhavendra Puri is the guru for Ishwara Puri. And. Um, Ramachandra Puri, right. And then Mahaprabhu is the disciple of Ishwara Puri, right? Yeah, so next generation. Right, okay, next generation. Okay, so, so of course, we know what happened, right? Madhavendra Puri is about to leave his body and he's crying out for Krishna and Ramachandra Puri said, what is the matter with you? You, you, you know, um, a Brahman is everywhere. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, first of all, that is one. <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, what could go on about how do you say something like that to your spiritual master? I mean, he has some audacious. Uh, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, what an example this is, right? And the, and then if it weren't bad enough, if that weren't bad enough, he didn't just find fault with Mahaprabhu Garanga, he created the fault. He sprinkled sugar on the floor. And then claimed he was eat, Mahaprabhu was eating too many sweets. Yeah, and he would feed devotees too much, and then they would say that you eat too much. You eat too much. Yeah. Mm. So it's interesting that going back to your example of please criticize me, Chaitanya, the devotees were upset, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu remained quite respectful throughout. Yes. He says, you know, he's teaching me the duty of a kshatriya, of a That's sannyasi right. rather. That's right. So uh and Bhakti Siddhanta was also disappointed when that fellow died. So now, although now that, that example, if you consider, Ramchandra Puri didn't meet a very good fate, and that was because his intent was not good. But our focus can be more on the fact that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not like hyper defensive or counter aggressive. He was right. he was you call almost submissive, receptive. Right. Yeah. So now going back to an earlier point when you said like somebody needs to stand up and somebody is being hurt. See, in this case, the example which you gave is is actually it's on the border. It's like I talk about skills and faith. So in this case, it's not just a skill of writing a book. It's you're writing a book about what a spiritual master, a, a book on which a commentary on a book that a spiritual master also has commented. So it's an issue of both in the border, I would say, that you have the ability to write, but you also have the adhikar, spiritual adhikar. But if you go a little bit deeper, say, in general, I find that criticism in the public domain uh, often. Uh, disturbs people more. So let's extend the situation in two, three different ways. So if this devotee had a doubt, uh, now there are some questions which are there in a lot of people's minds. And so better ask, somebody asks it and gets it addressed. Hmm? Another is that there is, that question is not there in anybody's mind, but basically a question is asked and that sows the seed of doubt. And so in that case, maybe that same thing might better be done in the, in the, maybe privately he comes and meets you and asks you about this. So yeah. not in this case, but say if two different spiritual masters have different moods, different emphasis, and then yes. one spiritual master starts criticizing the other spiritual master. So then it becomes, uh, it becomes very disruptive. So 
so it, it, it even when distraught. things are being if so even when there is a somebody is mm-hmm. being hurt uh, wouldn't it be better to actually try to have a do things in the private domain so that the possibility of a dialogue is more because otherwise once it goes into the public domain then everybody can draw whatever conclusions and they can distort and they can aggravate things so yes so in that sense uh, when somebody is being hurt now again the question comes up how do you decide when somebody is being hurt so one one spiritual master might feel that the way the spiritual master is this the spiritual master is teaching actually is he is hurting his followers because he is not getting them to follow prabhupad truly so again the, the there is a subjectivity about deciding what is what is hurtful enough to be uh, raised in the public domain and what is what should be reserved to the private domain yeah that's a very difficult thing to negotiate and it's something in which i have found myself challenged by um and something that is is tricky uh your question is you know one part of your question was how do you know when someone is being hurt or whether a lot of people are being hurt when there is a leading devotee if if one presents oneself mm. as a devotee responsible for something that affects so many devotees and in the process even is hurting so many devotees and even in the knowledge that he's hurting so many devotees still does not serve those devotees hearts then there's something wrong then those devotees need help being heard yes bro and so it's very yeah. tricky it's very tricky you see if if i was unwilling to hear this devotee in the temple room you know how can you do this this is painful to me that you've done this and and i said well you know what prabhu your pain is absurd i've been authorized to do this your pain is i'm not going to address your pain hmm i'm going to ignore your pain why because prabhupad saw that i was uh, becoming a scholar he he authorized my being a scholar he read my work he read my master's thesis on the chaitanya charitamrita really he, prabhupad read that yeah oh amazing yeah was that also published the master thesis no no it was not and um um it was my really my first year of graduate school at the university of chicago and then while i was on my way to harvard i satsrup maharaj insisted that i send the master thesis to him to prabhupad and that was way back in you know in the beginning of june or or end of may and i didn't want to and because prabhupad was sickly and he was not feeling well and um this was would be prabhupad's last summer here on earth and uh i didn't want to bother prabhupad so satsrup and i had a big fight about whether or not to so he he said this will please prabhupad please send it to him so i finally sent it to prabhupad with a cover letter to brindavan where prabhupad ended up going back after he tried to come to the US but he got as far as the UK London and the manor and then he went back to brindavan where he would stay for the remaining days of his life here so prabhupad was on his back but he was going through my thesis and satsrup happened to be his secretary at the time so i i didn't know that but because you know the secretaries would switch around they'd rotate you know Hmm. So Satsrup, the very person who forced me to send the manuscript, the, the the thesis to him, was there. He read my letter to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, "Please tell him, I am pleased he is preaching on such a high platform." Now, at that time, 
Prabhupada had every opportunity to say, no, tell him to stop writing. This is no good. He had every opportunity. He didn't do that. He encouraged me. Hmm. So, and of course, I took his appreciation, Prabhupada's appreciation, as something I should attain, try to attain. Not that I was preaching on such a high platform then, but something I need to keep trying to attain. So I'm still trying, Shaitanya Charanji. I'm still trying. Prabhu, you're phenomenally successful in what you're doing. I think uh, the way you are able to you shared with me about your course also and a five-star review and uh, the way your books are written and the kind of reviews you get. And last time you mentioned about how you have become a authority, especially in the Ras Panchadhyay. So yes. certainly it's, uh, so, so it's this is the point trailblazing. Yeah. yeah. So the point is this, that, I mean, I could have pulled rank. I could have said Prabhupada said this again. I could have hidden behind Prabhupada. I could, I could have, you know, I mean, maybe later on in the discussion, I could have given him some assurance that Prabhupada, you know, liked that I was going in this direction. I was the only devotee who expressly went back into the academics. No one else had done this. The devotees with degrees already arrived with their degrees when they came to the movement. I arrived with no degree. I arrived with three years of undergraduate study, and then I dropped out Okay. to join the ashram. So I went back to get the bachelor's and then to go on to the doctorate, master's and doctorate. Mm. So again, I mean, I could have pulled that kind of thing. Look, you know, how can you argue with someone who went to Harvard, has three degrees from Harvard? You know, no. See, again, you can hide behind that too. Oh, we so are it could about be some... Sangha. Sangha. Yeah. It's, it's you don't want to borrow authority from anywhere. You no. want to bring your authenticity forward. Stand on your own. Yeah. Beautiful. But, but, but let, that, let that meet the heart and the mind of the other person. Hmm. So... Now, now, the thing is this. We're dealing... We have a choice, especially as we advance in Krishna Bhakti, on what platform do we want to be speaking? And we have a choice if we have the ability to be sensitive to where my audience is in receptivity. So my capacity, their receptivity. Capacity as a Kanishta Bhakta, capacity as a Madhyama Bhakta, capacity as an Uttama Bhakta. Or let me put it this way. Sometimes it's not good to put it the way I just did. Sometimes we devotees, Chaitanya Charanji, think that these are categories that we fit in. You know, I've been a Kanishta Bhakta for so many years. And then one day I woke up and I became a Madhyama Bhakta. I call you up, Chaitanya Charanji, guess what? Today, I'm a Madhyama Bhakta. You know, and of course, you'll congratulate me and so on. Okay, now, it doesn't work that way. There are parts of me that are Kanishta, parts of me that are Madhyama, parts that, that can be Uttama, if I really put my mind to it. So in speaking philosophy, in presenting Krishna Bhakti, the more we are seasoned in the Krishna Bhakti practice, the more choices we have in these regards. We can be narrow-minded, open-minded, or broad-minded in our presentations. That's beautiful. I think we had discussed this earlier once, about these three-mindedness. Well, right? Well, I think yeah, we went over true. this, right? But, yeah. but the audience, 
Recep reception can be narrow, can be open, and can be broad. So you see it gets complex. I present no. something from a, a Madhyama level, and they receive it, say, on a Kanishta level. Suddenly, my Madhyama stuff has been reduced to Kanishta stuff. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? You know, right? Or, or, or I'm speaking, you know, the highest thing I know, right? The Uttama. I'm speaking Uttama philosophy. And then someone takes it from a Madhyama, reduces it to a Madhyama or Kanishta. You know, a very good example of this could be, now how yeah. things can Prabhupada, I think in the one of the Gita purports says that therefore we should worship only Vrindavan Krishna, not even divert our minds toward Vishnu or Ram or other manifestations. Yeah. Now yeah. Prabhupada is speaking almost like in the mood of the gopis of Vrindavan, you know, when they saw Vishnu, yes. he doesn't want they don't want to. But if somebody takes it at the Kanishta level, they may start saying, you know, why are we having Ram deities in our temples? And if somebody is worshipping Ram since childhood, many dynasties, many generations, they say, stop worshipping that. Start worshipping Krishna. That will be like a Madhyam Kanishta mismatch. Sorry, Uttam Kanishta mismatch. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it's, it's tricky coordinating them. So, ideally, the speaker, if someone is given a platform to speak on the asana, he or she ideally would have the capacity to speak on the highest level possible in their capacity, but yet to account for a narrow and open-minded levels of reception. Despite the broad-minded and high-minded presentation, one is able to address the narrow-minded and the open-minded. Mm. I have to even do this in the university, Chaitanya Charan. You know, I, I spent years studying comparative religion at Harvard. My degree is in comparative religion. And then I've been teaching for over 30 years in the university. Now, it's what makes a really popular professor at the university is someone who really can speak to these different levels of understanding and reception and receptivity. So what should come along with the capacity of speaking very uh, at very high levels is the pedagogical capacity to be sensitive. So one may speak at a high level, but one's pedagogical capacity might be that of a Kanishta. So there's the, no, the presentation, but then there's the, the ability to transmit and teach, which may be very low. So when you're saying the two things, it's like the content and the mode of presentation. So somebody might be speaking on, say, Ras Lila, but they might speak it from a Kanishta platform. That's right. Okay. That's right. And, and then, but they may be, but they may actually have a good pedagogy. They may be a very good teacher. They may have very little knowledge of the Rasa Panchadyayi, but they may have Madhyama, a capacity to teach. And then the audience may have a, a Kanishta or Madhyama level of reception. You so see, when you say you have to do this in the, just a minute, when you say you have to do this in the, uh, in the acad in your classrooms also, so are you saying yes. that this, this is not just a categorization of levels of devotees, but it is like a categorization of broad human mentality itself? Yes. Yes. That's why I translate it into these categories of narrow, open, and broad. When an outsider hears something that could potentially be very incendiary, hmm. if he or she says, well, how, so an outsider could say, well, Prabhupada is uh, a misogynist. Yeah. yeah. Okay, very narrow-minded. But an out, another outsider might say, well, my understanding is Prabhupada came here to teach people how to love God. So we'd have to look into this more, you know? That's broad-minded. See, that's a broad-minded understanding. 
to suspend judgment is a mature uttama category. So we are not well, really accepting the criticism directly, nor are we getting in the mode of defending Prabhupada. They're saying we have to look at, so this was Prabhupada's mission, and then let us look at it in the light of this mission. That's right. That's the broad-minded outsider. The broad-minded minded insider, you and I, hopefully, will present things that Prabhupada has said with the broadest understanding and context of the whole of his, of his presentation, with the ultimate intent. Just as Krishna says in the last words, he speaks to Arjuna in the Gita, 1872. Have you heard this whole teaching with thought focused on the single highest point? Mm. That is Uttama presentation of philosophy. To take parts of the philosophy and just present them without that focus on the single highest point is not Uttama presentation. It's a more Madhyama presentation. And then to just take one part as if it were the whole, that is Kanishta. Oh, okay. So when you are, I'm just trying to understand the connection with the words. When you're saying that uh, <clears throat> 1872, you're quoting. So you are, you are in a sense changing that inquiry to Arjuna into a mode in which Krishna has presented and a mode which we should also present. So Krishna yes. has made a one-pointed presentation. Now Arjuna is asked, Krishna is asking Arjuna, have you heard in a similarly one-pointed way? So whether there is a match in there in the audience and the speaker. Yes. So even though there are diverse teachings, as you know very well, yeah, you okay. probably know it better than I do, Chaitanya Charanji. Uh, is that. a compilation of extraordinarily diverse teachings, hmm. practices, views, visions. Krishna presents this rhetorical question to Arjuna in the very last words he speaks, instructing all of us to keep our teaching, our presentation on the single highest point, on the very summit. This is a powerful teaching in the Gita, very powerful. Hmm. So in terms of criticizing, if I say something here, in our talk, okay, so we're having a nice conversation. You, at least I'm enjoying it. I don't care if you are. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. But, you know, who knows whether you are or not. But anyway. But the I'm having much, that, more than fun. <laughs> much more fun. Than fun. Okay, good. But mm. if I say something, if I say something that, that does not sound complete enough, I would hope you would say something. I would respect that coming from you. Someone who's so well read, someone who is in love with the philosophy, someone who you know is absorbed all the time, someone who's interviews and is engaged in dialogue with so many devotees. To me, a criticism coming from you would be would make my day. So mm. you know. So, so you know, every once a week, you know, I you know that I'm working on the Yoga Sutra from the, with the Bhakti Vision, right? It's to be published by okay. Yale University Press. Well, once a week, I have a little group of devotees I call up on Zoom, and I ask them to tear it apart. I, I share my screen, I show my translations, and I ask them to rip it apart. Criticize the heck out of it. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want people to criticize me. I want people to criticize my work. Why? So it will grow. So I will grow. So it will be better. Hmm. Now, not everyone has that attitude. Okay. That's true. I even tell my disciples don't hold back challenge anything that I say that doesn't feel quite right to you. Don't play this submissive thing, you know? Pariprashna, right? In the Gita 434, 
Pari Prashna. Not just Prashna. Pari Prashna. Okay. Every kind of inquiry. So Prabhu, any doubt, any doubt, challenge me. It's not really a, crit a criticism. By the way, sometimes I've caught myself incorrect. I said, oh my gosh, did I say that? Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Here's what I meant to say. Then you're giving me a chance to rise to the occasion by criticizing. Mm. So Prabhu, I'm sensing that when you are using the word, please criticize me, it's more in the sense of please question me. Because the yeah. word que question has a, the word criticism has a, has a negative connotation where it's almost like, say, somebody is putting themselves on a higher pedestal and, and looking down. Yeah. Now, it doesn't have to, but it often, because the word criticism, as it is used uh, maybe in academia, and as it is used in the general society, they have two yeah. diff very different connotations. So right. critical thinking or a critique or a, right. a, a critical review, no, those are like useful abilities in the academic world. That's right. The word criticism is used in a significantly negative sense in the general world. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Very, very good observation. And I'm glad you're making that distinction, Chaitanya Charanji. You're right. In academics, uh, you know, your work is sent out for blind review and you get your, you know, criticisms. But even in that context, those criticisms are not like gossiped behind my back. The criticisms are brought to me and now I get to respond. So again, mm. conversation. But you're right. Now, when the word criticism is used in the academic setting, it's much more neutral than it is in common parlance. And it means being analytical, analyzing something. You're right. Hmm. So thank you okay. for bringing that out. Yeah. So in that sense, if you consider, please question me, uh, Prabhupada does uh, do that. Then the morning disciples, he would take the devil's advocate or he'd ask his disciples to take the devil's advocate. And the, I had attended a few talks uh, or I had connected with a few spiritual teachers before I was introduced to the Krishna conscious movement. So one thing that struck me was that we welcome questions so much. Uh, but not so many other teachers would welcome questions. They would give talks, good talks, but that would be more or less it. So that questioning attitude is good. And now going a little deeper, you know, that about some Prabhupada's quotes, which might seem uh, questionable. So I also feel that... Uh, there is a need for a forum where questions can be asked. Otherwise, that that why is Prabhupada saying like this? How can I make sense about it? So yes. we, we will keep that in the heart and that will choke us and that will uh, that will erode our faith in Prabhupada. So yes. again, when so we could say whenever there is a doubt or like you said, something doesn't yes. seem right, then yes. there has to be a forum where questioning can be done. So, Absolutely. But Chaitanya Charanji, maybe more than you are aware, possibly, many devotees are nervous about questioning. I mean, maybe it's you can question the outside world and so on, but I invite people to question me. And that's scary to question the devotee. What are your qualifications? You know, I remember walking, I remember when my book, uh, Dance of the Divine, published by Princeton, came out in 19, uh, 2005. I gave a lecture down in Alachua, a Sunday feast. Um, there it's very crowded at night, it's dark. And I was passing by some younger devotees in a group, a group of young ladies, d d obviously devotees. And some of them were saying, who is this Garuda? What right does he have to speak on the Rasa Panchadhyayi? I think now, between you and me, Chaitanacharan, that is a fantastic question. But why did it not come to me? Hmm. They should, because they are afraid. 
the you know my weekly discussions with my own group of devotees has this um, this statement: "We are a community of love and trust. We value above all else complete, honest, and open dialogue, genuine sharing, and freedom of thought. Any and all questions, challenges, and critiques are most." welcome. We strive to create a safe space for opening minds and hearts unfettered by dogma, doctrine, and any social or institutional fears. We invite you to connect with us as you so desire. That's, that sounds more like a free thinkers forums manifesto than a devotee sangha manifesto. Well, it's it's. I feel that it's so important that devotees speak their minds and hearts openly and honestly. Hmm. If they have doubts, they should voice them. And again, otherwise, see, these are thought to be criticisms, and criticisms are thought to be aparads, and aparads destroy devotional service. So that's the line of thinking. You see. So then there is a... And most devotees don't even know what aparad means. Exactly. So there is almost a, a fear that I might offend. And that's why I don't even question. And then that, that, in, that prevents the growth of the heart. That even prevents the growth of the head. So in that sense, uh, I'm, much, I'm much more comfortable with the idea of questioning. And of course, questioning, like you said... In the in the inappropriate forum, and so now where this goes off is uh, so till now I am like, I could say that I am fully with you. In fact, I felt that over the years, maybe after I was ten years in Krishna consciousness, I found that, that there are certain questions you couldn't ask, and then when I found a forum where I could ask those questions, it was liberating. Yeah, it was like I good. got a, almost a, a new life in my body. Yes. So in that yes. sense, so if we are talking about the, the, the courage to ask questions, the, the openness to receive questions, and then growing that way, and that is a vital limb of bhakti that is, uh, that is, not, is often not addressed adequately. So... So, so I full, I'm fully with you in that. So, but at the same time, there has to be some caution because it's so easy to, uh, nowadays the social media available, if I have to criticize, then I don't criticize with any intention of having a dialogue. I criticize with the intention of just spreading the negativity around. Right. And I might say that I'm protecting people I'm, because you know that is bad and I'm protecting the people from the bad. So right. I think that is something which also, uh, so we could say that there is a excess of not questioning at all. And there could be an excess of uh, indiscriminate criticism. So, yes. so what we need is that discerning criticism. And I think that is, that is something which is a challenge. Yes, it is. But Chaitanya Charanji, let me remind you what it says in the Bhakti Sutra. One of its aphorisms says that when one is very seasoned in Krishna Bhakti, that one protects and preserves the Bhakti Shastras. Shastra Rakshanam. Shastra Rakshanam. When I see someone who is supposed to represent a leading devotee in the movement, who is supposed to represent our Krishna Bhakti tradition and is obsessed with some kind of relatively superficial issue of the outer world, and this becomes his preoccupation. Something's wrong. Hmm. So I inquire, why are you doing this? It seems to me to be 
misrepresenting our Krishna Bhakti tradition. Please explain. Now, the, there are several options here. One, he doesn't write me back. He completely ignores me. That is a response, Chaitanya Charanji. No response is a response. Thomas Aguna response, but nonetheless a response. He could then respond. Would you all just just a minute? Would you yeah. always consider a no response as a Tamagoni response? Because sometimes you know some people are just like they exist to argue. Oh, that's different. That's different. Okay. Even if they exist to argue, look, the fellow that stood up in the temple room, Chaitanya Charan, he wasn't really open to a dialogue. Because, let me take the higher road and turn this into dialogue. If we are advanced bhaktas, we can take gold from a dirty place. Mahaprabhu took instruction from Ramachandra Puri about not eating too, too many sweets or, or too much, right? Hmm. You know, if we are advanced enough, we not only can respond, we should respond. Look, I went on to a, I found by accident, a Facebook stream where people were slamming me to the ultimate. Oh my gosh, <laughs> they, they, they called me, you know, the right hand man of the devil. Uh, again, producing the Bhagavad Gita. Um, uh, there were about six people slamming me. Just now, I wasn't a friend of any of theirs, so I couldn't go into the conversation and offer my services. But I did write to each one of them. I said, I have read your thread condemning me as a devotee, condemning me as um, uh, some kind of pseudo scholar, condemning what my, my work, my life's work, a, a, a kind of comprehensive condemnation of me and my work and my bhakti life. I said, I would like to engage in dialogue with you about it. if you know how I can better my devotional service if you can guide me to higher levels of performance, I would be perfectly happy to hear this. You could be my teacher. Tell me how I can perform better. Not one of them wrote me back. Hmm. So here... I was a Chaitanya Charanji. I was open. If they came back to me and said, uh, Garuda, why don't you be writing this? Or why don't you be doing that? You know, you should take, you should remove, you should go to Harper Collins, despite the fact that you've sold 50,000 of the Gitas, you should remove it from the, from the public. Give me reasons why. If they're good enough, I'll do it. I'm open. Why am I open, Chaitanya Charanji? Why? Is it because I'm humble? I don't really consider myself terribly humble, honestly. Okay, I'm. Uh, I, I have a big fat ego. I have a lot. I have. I can have an ego about. Okay, so I don't think it's that. But I do understand myself to be a very tiny jiva. Tatasta shakti, very infinitesimal jiva which means that whatever I do will always be incomplete. Whatever mm. I do, even if I speak Uttama philosophy, even that will be incomplete because I am a little jiva. So I can, oh, what's the correction for this? What, what is the response to this? What's the antidote to my smallness? Is dialogue, is sharing. And that's what bhakti means, is sharing. Not one of these six critical, more than criti critical, condemning, uh, name calling, but I overlooked all of that. I said, 
I wrote to each one. I said, you, all of you sound particularly angry and upset and you resorted to uh, bad language and, con and, and uh, words of condemnation. I'm writing to you to seek your guidance then. If you see things wrong in me, please elevate me. Mm. I'm here to learn. It was sincere. Not a one wrote me back. So in a sense, it's like nowadays in the media, there is this term called echo chambers. People live in their own almost alternate universes and they don't want to hear the opposite perspective. And they just want to hear their idea being repeated by others and they want to communicate only with those who have similar ideas. So in a sense, what you are saying is, when you say, please criticize me, we are basically trying to avoid like we, we all living in our own echo chambers, isolated and having our own conceptions about ourselves, misconceptions about others, that will prevent us from growing and uh, we will get stultified. Yes. So in that sense, we could say that it's uh, if we really want to have deep discussions with anyone, if you want to go beyond pleasantries, then there are definitely some some uncomfortable topics that have to be discussed. Yes. And it is, so please criticize me is basically like an invitation to, or a call to go to toward those deeper discussions, even if they are, even if they are uncomfortable. Yes. So. Beautiful. I, I like the way you have said this. Yes, bro. Thank you. So I, I mean, now I'm, I could say I'm fully on the, fully on, on board with what you're saying, because Please criticize me is, um, you know, uh, I remember at one time I had made a post on a particular issue and one of the prominent uh, conservative leaders of the movement, he had made a exactly opposite take on the same issue. Yeah. And then his followers wrote to me criticizing me, you know, how dare you oppose him and you are offending him and this and that. So then I wrote to him and then he was surprisingly broad minded. He said, this is a, this is a social issue. And, uh, you know, I'll be happy to have uh, uh, more honest differences of opinion in our movement. Yeah. You know, if so, if somebody says that, if somebody starts going against the core Siddhanta, then I'll be criticizing. But here, this is a social issue. Different people can have different opinions on this. So I was very, uh, I would say, very reassured as well as delighted to see that. But that also led to some discussion again. Yes. So, Beautiful. That's what it's all about. Mm. It's all about dialogue and connecting. Not isolation. It's about connection. Isolation is kanishta. Mm. Narrow. Narrow. Madhyama is beginning, is in the the, the, it moving into a greater world of connecting. Uttama, you're connected. You're you're you appreciate all views and and you appreciate it. That's true. We so now as, as as advanced devotees as or I should say not advanced devotees but as devotees who are advancing, okay? Yeah. Advancing. We have choices that we can make here, Chaitanya Charanji. We really do. Hmm. Even what you're doing here, okay? Okay, what are you doing here? You invited me to come and talk to you. That, of course, that's your first mistake, but that's, you'll have to deal with that later. But, <laughs> I would love to repeat this mistake throughout my life. <laughs> That's right. Well, I mean, you may end up repeating the mistake. That's your, again, your problem. But joking aside, what are you doing here? What you are doing here is you are receiving. I mean, I could be anybody. I could be anyone with any kind of view, very narrow view, very broad view. Who knows? You don't know exactly what I'm going to say when I get on here. It's a risk. It's a risk. Mm. And Rupa Goswami talks about taking risk in devotional service. Now, I don't think he meant, you know, 
um, a jumping off a, a bungee jump, uh, uh, you know, between mount. I don't think he talked about, you know, uh, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. I don't think he was talking about that kind of risk. He's talking about risking the heart. Beautiful. Open, open the heart. Take risks. Being here with you, Chaitanya Charanji, this is a terrible risk for me. I mean, I'm opening my heart to you. I mean, what, what, what am I thinking? You know, I mean, I should have thought about this, you know. But joking aside, we are taking risk with each other. I'm risking, I'm open. You're open back. There's a reciprocation. And in the process, mutual openness as bodhayanta paraspara. Then we become mutually enlightening one another. Hmm. And that is tushyanticha, ramanticha. So enjoyable. So I'm enjoying this very much and don't really care if you are or not. I mean, you know, just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, these are the times when the the hearts bond together. Yeah. When, when sure. actually... Nowadays, in the mainstream world, people talk about vulnerability quite a bit, you know, the power of vulnerability. So we are making ourselves vulnerable. So yeah. I, I was always wondering whether there is any, any precedent for that in our scriptures. But the point of taking risk is exactly the same thing. I never thought of it in that oh, context. Oh, 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 definitely. It's right there in the beginning of our process. Shravanam means totally vulnerable or receptive. Kirtanam means contribution. And we take turns. Like a seesaw. Did you ever have seesaws in your childhood? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you had that in India? Yes, yeah. yes. We also have seesaw in, in, uh, in, in parks, you know? You yeah. go on seesaw. So while one is up, one is down. The one up is vulnerable. Like, hey, I'm, I'm hanging here. I'm in the air. You know, so I'm receptive. This is reception. It takes mm. a certain amount of trust. That's and then the person down is the one who's kirtana. And then he or she goes up, right? So there's a back and forth. It's a beautiful balance of kirtanam and shravanam, shravanam, kirtanam. And and then when things are perfectly balanced, they become elevated to a state of Vishnu smart. Hmm. This beautiful, you know, I always had this question that this Guhiyam Akhyati Pruchyati, no. we don't really see examples of that in scripture so much. Let me put let me clarify what I mean by this is what you did about Shravanam Kirtanam seesaw. I agree that that's what we need for uh, deep discussions. But most of the time, what we see in scripture is like one person is authority and other person is questioning. So if we consider the Krishna Arjuna discussion, or Shukdeva Goswami Parishit Maharaj discussion, at one level, it's heart to heart. But it is, it is like 90% one person is speaking or 95% one person is speaking. So and the other person is speaking about 5% or 10%. So that two equals sharing their heart with each other. Yeah. I don't see that some that is something like recorded yeah. in our scripture. No, no, you do see it. You see it in the Rabananda Roy Mahaprabhu Garanga Catechism. Chapter 8, Mandyalila. But you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu puts himself in a subordinate position over there. Well, you know, like, you know it's back and forth, you know? It's a, it's, it's a back and forth and, and they're, they're it's it no that's a but that's a great example of a back and forth balance the way we're talking about. I agree with you that in the Bhagavata and the Gita Upanishad, right, that, that there's more the teacher student. Okay. I mean, look, when I teach at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, which I'm going to be doing this semester, these are higher level students. So there'll be more seminar-like, right? Okay. But, und but undergraduates, what do they, they don't know. 
So it's much more top down, right? Oh, okay. graduate study is more, you know, it's closer. In fact, sometimes the graduate student will bring in something I never knew. Mm. Does, does uh, Graham Schweig PhD know everything? Well, he thinks he does, but he doesn't. <laughs> Factually, he does not. And he loves to be surprised by a student who says A, B, C, D, and he goes, well, that is really something. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful. So, so now interesting, going back to the CISO example, so you put the person who is high up as the vulnerable. That's the yes. opposite, of, opposite of the hierarchy. You know, like say Shukdev Goswami sits on a high pedestal and Parikshit Maharaj is at a lower pedestal. But here are saying, yes. since somebody is high up, you can, I mean, you can easily shoot them down. That's right. You can, you can, you can, they can fall off. They can, and it's interesting. The one who is higher is the should be the authority. the 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 most authoritative. The more authoritative we are, the greater capacity we have to hear. Really. So there is a paradox. Reception. Prabhupada said, if we could hear the Maha Mantra just once perfectly. Okay, now, now we could put it in this sense also that, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to mean in terms of quantity, you have to hear more, but the higher up somebody is, even with a few words, they can gather a lot. Yes. Because they can, they're sensitized to the, not just the words, but the heart. And they have that, uh, they themselves have a caring heart. Absolutely. Okay. Beautiful. Absolutely. So yeah. there, you know, and as you know, there are limitations to metaphors, but you can also switch metaphors around a little bit, which we just did. Okay, switch the metaphor, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so now going back to the, this is very beautifully moving forward now. So yes, moving forward. So now it's time for you to criticize me. Well, I think you addressed most of my criticisms because I have, my criticism was about the word criticism. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And that's the way I started myself. <laughs> that, that, yeah. D devotees telling devotees not to criticize. But I'm yeah. saying that this is, a this is a critical statement. They're assuming. They're making that's the true. assumption I'm busy criticizing. And they're also making the mm -hmm. assumption that I don't want to be criticized, which is not the, not the fact. I want to be criticized. Yes. True. So now, you know, there are three things we could, again, going back to the earlier point of yeah. the person should be receptive to, to gain criticism. And our focus today is on that. You know, like, don't become too defensive or aggressive when somebody criticizes us, because through that criticism, we will all learn. And we all, we all have so much to learn. Right. So that's, that's a very important uh, attitude with respect to, uh, say, humility and growth from our side. Mm, now from the other side, uh, I'd like to mention earlier that there is the fear that if I'm criticizing, I'm committing aparad. So yes. what are the cautions that when somebody is offering criticism, what, what should they be careful about? Now my understanding of aparad is that it is not just uh, anything that uh, anything critical is aparad, it is usually the intention that matters most. Now, it's generally with the, with the intention of pulling down somebody out of envy. When we do act or speak, that is when it really becomes a serious aparad. But then yes. I could go to the other extreme and there are examples, I think in the Goswami's life, where there was a lame Vaishnava who was walking along the road and Rupa Goswami was meditating on Radha Krishna. And in the meditation, he saw something like uh, some humorous thing Krishna did to Radha. And he started laughing. And this lame Vaishnava was walking along. He thought that this Rupa Goswami is laughing at me. And he got hurt by that. Yeah. And then Rupa Goswami's vision disappeared. So then the story goes that because this devotee was displeased with him, so Krishna was displeased with him and Krishna disappeared from his vision. 
So then he went and found that devotee and clarified what had, what was going on, and then that devotee was uh, pacified, and then he again resumed his devotional meditation. See, so there is dialogue. There is dialogue. <laughs> okay, beautiful. You are bringing it back to the same point. There we go. There we go. <laughs> so, so you are saying that we need to also be cognizant of the fact that there is one level of definition of of aparad is that we don't want to hurt any devotee. So even if somebody is feeling hurt, then also we need to have a dialogue to clarify it. And so, yes, yes. So um, I was trying to deal with a major movement issue, and I found that uh, the, a devotee who was involved, a leading devotee, who was involved in an issue. He felt hurt by me, and I went to him and I tried to engage in dialogue. He refused to speak with me directly, but to just go through emails, which, of course, is kind of half dialogue. You know, when you're just communicating through. So I was very disappointed. This is a devotee with whom I had been in constant dialogue, quite a bit on and off throughout the years. I apologized to him. I said to him, "If there was any way I hurt you, I apologize privately." To you, I will address it fully. I will address it fully in public if you want me to. But this does involve your hurting many devotees. So, I spill. I just. I left. I gave myself fully. I said, "Whatever you want to do." I apologize for any way that I overlooked something in, and if I was insensitive, or. Um, uh, unaware of something and I'm willing to actually apologize and make up for it. Mm, it's not about forgiveness. You know, devotees have this forgiveness thing going on. I mean, Shaitanya Charan, if you are living in a house and I, and I'm angry one day with you, I'm just so angry and I take it out by burning your house down. And I realize the next day, Oh my God. Oh my God. I can't believe I did what I did. So I go up to you. I say, Chaitanya Charan, will you forgive me? I, I burnt your house down. I was angry with you, but but I realized how awful that was. Will, will you forgive me? First of all, wait a second. Why are we talking about you forgiving me? I burnt your house down. What I should be coming to you for is not forgiveness. I should be saying, oh, I apologize. And you know what? I'm going to build you another house. Forgiveness is all about me. Chaitanya Charan, forgive me. I burnt your house down. That's all I care about. To hell with your other house. Look, you didn't like that house anyway. And you don't care about having another house. You're a Nazi or whatever. Okay. So, you know, in other words, I can rationalize all I want. But the fact is, I burnt your house down. Now it's not a, it's horrible just to ask for forgiveness. I need to make this up to you. I need to build you another house. So what you're trying to say by this is, if somebody starts criticizing, now we're talking to the other person's perspective, somebody yes. starts criticizing and their criticism ends up becoming destructive, then yes. they need to take responsibility, not just, uh, not just apologize and think it's done, but right. they need to... Right take responsibility yes in fact, in fact uh, this same devotee about whom i'm speaking which is, remains nameless he was so upset with me that he started uh, spreading very trashy thoughts about me to a few devotees what he didn't know is that those devotees upon hearing these things were so uncomfortable about hearing this that they came to me and told me what he was saying. I then first, I said, I don't believe he would say those things. They're outrageous. So I wrote directly to him. I said, I have heard from several devotees that you're saying A, B, C, and D about me. Is this true? If you don't respond to me, I will assume that it is true and that you don't have enough courage to face it. 
if you do respond, then I will take it from there. I'll take it from however you respond. Maybe you didn't say these things. But I'm getting this from four different devotees. He admitted that he was saying these things. He said, I was not myself. I was off my equilibrium. He said, and I apologize. I said, don't apologize to me. I don't need your apology. Those other devotees need your apology because you put trash in their minds. Don't apologize to me. I don't accept your apology. Go to them and apologize and correct what you said. And he did, to his credit. Hmm. Again, don't apologize. Don't, don't accept my apology for burning your house down. Make sure I build you another house. Yeah. Don't, no, no, no. Forgiveness. Please. Chaitanya Charan, please forgive me for burning your house down. Please, please. It's, it's all about me. It's not about you. What about you? Where are you living? You have no house. True. You see, it's it's so it's so backwards. We can't just apologize. We can't ask for forgiveness, which is still so egocentric. Make up for it. Do something to counter the damage you've done. Then there is a good platform for forgiveness. True, fully true. You know, nowadays, forgiveness has become more about uh, becoming free from that burden on my heart. So even if I seek forgiveness from, for something wrong that I have done, or even if I give forgiveness, so I want to give forgiveness so that I don't resent you. I want to seek forgiveness so that I don't, uh, I don't feel guilty. But in neither case, the actual issue is necessarily being addressed. So, yeah, so the, right. the issue has to be actually addressed. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I say that, you know, uh, I wrote an article on the Ramayana. So I talked about how you now Wali, when he realized what he had done to Ram, uh, to his brother Sugriva, so he acknowledged his fault. Then he apologized and then he amended. So I talk about these three things, acknowledgement, apology and amending. So the amending that he did was he had a necklace that granted him practical immortality. As long as he was wearing the necklace, he would not die. Yeah. So he could have very well given that necklace to his son Angada, but he gave it to Sugriva. Beautiful. So, this is beautiful. Very good points, Chaitanya Sharanji. I'd like to read about this. Oh, okay, I'll send you that article, Ru. You have to send me, yeah. Good. Sure. Thank you. So this is, uh, I think, so we talked about the, the eagerness of the person to receive criticism and yes. then the caution of the person in giving criticism. Mm? That's right. That if, if the they're doing a destructive. The, uh, the sensitivity. Yeah. yeah. So then hey, now let hey, me. In the, in, in the process, we may very well not be sensitive and when that is obvious, then we try to become more sensitive. Hmm. But if the other person is finds himself or herself too resentful, too, you know, um, fearful, hmm. they will go away. Or the person who is criticizing may find it too, this is too scary, and then they go away. The problem is when we go away, Chaitanya Chara. When we fall out of dialogue, hmm. even the even the Vrajagopikas stepped aside and say, we're the most fortunate women in the whole world. They stopped their interplay with Krishna to think about that and to become self-conscious. Although appearing to be very appreciative, but they they, they got out of the zone, right? Beautiful. We have to stay in the zone, the seesaw. You One person can't seesaw. Have you ever tried? Yeah, sorry. One person can't, of course, no. Yeah, that's right. I have tried endlessly the seesaw by myself. I cannot do it. So true. Mm. You know, going now going back to the... Vaishna Aparad point, yes. I go, you, earlier like you quoted Prabhupada, uh, sometimes we quote Prabhupada to 
to like bring prabhupad in the middle of a honest dialogue yes so sometimes the whole paranoia about vaishnava aparad can come in the middle of a honest dialogue yeah yeah so it's like i have had this experience that on one side we may not want to criticize because we fear committing aparad and i remember one devotee spoke something very very painful for me and then then they maybe after a couple a day or two they came back and they said you know uh you are a, you are a very senior devotee and i don't want to offend you so kindly forgive me so i felt that that was uh, i mean i appreciated whatever they did i said you didn't really hurt me but the point was it is not so much of oh i don't want to do this fearful thing called vaishnava aparad it's not that i want to connect with you i want to understand you maybe i hurt you maybe i misunderstood you so vaishnava aparad while offering criticism and even while offering apology becomes a, a not vaishnava aparad per se but the fear of vaishnava aparad becomes like a stumbling block for connected connection of the hearts yeah beautiful chitanya charanji i so much appreciate your intelligent observations always and this is just one of them the fear of committing aparad ironically prevents dialogue exactly mm. and and that's that's not what you know i mean look if if we have fear of the 10 offenses to the holy name i mean look you know i mean one day i said just forget it i can't i'm not going to chant if, i mean I look at this 10 offenses i mean i'm going to commit these all the time back and forth up and down i mean why should i chant because chanting itself purifies one of the adashaparad that's a powerful dialogue, example dialogue itself dissolves the fear and the and the cause for any aparad it's there beautiful you know if somebody said that uh, i will stop chanting because i'm committing offense because i'm afraid of committing offenses we would consider that absurd but <laughs> we do that with respect to dialogue That's ultimately right. the purpose of aparad not committing vaishna aparad is to have loving relationships and loving relationship require dialogue otherwise how are we going to develop that so exactly. we are in one sense the fear of vaishna aparad is defeating the purpose of the vaishna aparad itself yeah. exactly exactly so we could say broadly a Vaish- the uh, vaishna aparad means at two extremes one is i try to avoid having uh, evil intentions or intentions envious intentions of others and the other is i am sensitive to how my actions are affecting the other person yeah so we could say vaishna aparad extends at two levels but sometimes i may have to speak something that hurt others of course i will try to ensure that i don't hurt more than necessary because some discussions are uncomfortable like we say the truth is unpalatable but the but the truth doesn't have to be spoken unpalatably so we can that's right. the way it's that's right the way it's yeah. spoken yeah yeah but you know the i mean the actual meaning of aparada hmm is away from loving you know i love the way you take sorry i love the way you take bhakti concepts and universalize them normally the aparad meaning we have is away from radha and that that's is right. true but ultimately what is radha rani radha is the embodiment of love so that's suddenly right. they expand so much away from love it becomes universal exactly mm-hmm. moving it's apart from love you know uh, chaitanya charan ji you know i uh, you know anutama ji right in, yeah. in the dc area so on so you know he has these vaishnav christian vaishnava muslim dialogues hmm and i've been going to them for 20 years okay so i've been i'm one of the main participants from the vaishnava side right mm. so at the end of these dialogues which go on for a day or a day and a half we generally go around and give reactions and what did you think you know the dialogue and most people say oh my gosh you know it was wonderful we found so many similarities and so on and when they get to me they're very shocked when they get to me i said i loved this dialogue and i couldn't stand it 
at the same time. The reason I can't stand it is because the people who need the dialogue are not here. We are already, everyone here is already so capable of dialogue. I wanna sit with someone that hates me. I wanna sit here with someone that will make me uncomfortable. And I wanna see if we can both connect. I wanna sit with a fanatic Christian who hates anyone of any other religious faith because they're all fake. They're, they're all uh, inauthentic. The only real religion is the faith of Jesus Christ, the faith in Jesus Christ. I want to sit with someone like that instead of people, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch. That's wonderful. We think alike. I want to engage in dialogue with people that may not like what I do as a Vaishnava. Mm. I want to sit with a Muslim. I want to sit with a Muslim who goes into the temple room and looks at the Arch of Vigraha and goes, oh my God. It's idol worship. Idolatry. Mm. I want to, I want to explain why it's not idolatry. I want to hear what is uncomfortable to them about what I do as a devotee. And I want the challenge of seeing if I can make them receptive to what I feel about what they're doing. I love that kind of challenge, Chaitanya Charanji. I like the hardball stuff. That's... You know, that's at one sense challenging, but when it works out, it's almost like a breakthrough. You know, you entered a new it's world. Wonderful. It's wonderful. Mm. You know, when I was at the LA Ratiatra years, uh, three, three years ago, there were these, this group of Christians heckling the devotees and everyone on the march, you know, holding up these huge signs of hell, fire, and brimstone. You're going to hell, you know, you're going to pay for this. Um, and there was one guy there who was huge, big, burly guy. I swear, his, the, 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 the size of his bicep was the width of my trunk, you know? I mean, <laughs> he, he was, and, and he had a bright blue t-shirt that he could barely fit in, and it said, trust Jesus, right? Scary looking character. I mean, no one, anyone would. Anyway, so I say to Prabhupada Velas, my disciple, I say to him, I say, let's go back to those Christians. I think, I think they just need a big hug. I really do. I just, I think they're just feeling lonely, you know? And he said, um, uh, Guru Dave, I, I don't think so. I, I, I really advise against this. I think it's dangerous. I said, no, don't worry. You, you stay, you know, a few yards behind me. I'll go, you know. So, of course, he had his phone with him. And um, I go up to this big, burly guy that looks like he's overqualified for football, right, in America, right? <laughs> okay. And, and I go up to him and I said, you know, I go, I go right up to him and I said, you know, I know that you have something that you feel is very important to communicate to us. And I would really like to hear that. Okay. But first, I really think you need a hug. I really do. I think you're, I just think you, your mother didn't give you enough hugs. So may I give you a big hug? So I wrap my, he said, yeah, I wrap my, you know, I, I spread my arms as wide as I can to give some kind of embrace to this this sequoia tree of a of a human, and he wraps his around me like easily, right? And we're hugging each other, and uh, and then I turn around and and uh, and, and there's Premananda Velasi takes a, a shot of us, 
with their arms around it. It's on my Facebook page if you ever take a look at it. Amazing. Um, anyway, it's and 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 there we are. And he was scared, you know. When one knows how to dialogue, one can be fearless. You know, one can be truly fearless, connecting with other hearts, with hearts that don't really want to connect with ours. But if the love is there, you can kind of sneak in there <laughs> and, and get and begin the dialogue. Begin the dialogue, the seed of a dialogue. Hmm. It's an amazing incident. So, in a sense, it's what not, you said in the what you said in the in the in the Vaishnava Christian dialogue, what was not happening there, you in a sense made that happen in the Ratyatra. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I want challenges. I want criticism. Please criticize me. I can take it. I want to grow. That's true. And uh, so you also gave some examples where you wanted a dialogue, but it didn't happen because the other person was not ready. Hmm? That's right. So sometimes it just doesn't work. So That's right. now there's also this understanding in Bhakti Sam Sindhu that we should we grow in like-minded association. Sajati Ashe Bhagavad Bhakti yes. Sangha. Yes. So now uh, at one level it's it's comfortable and natural to be with like-minded devotees and that is where we can actually uh, easily lower our guard yes. and open our hearts and yes. in that and there also even if criticism comes we can accept it but right. but if there are like extremely unlike mind unlike minded devotees yeah then it becomes uh, it becomes much more difficult to actually even receive criticism from them. Because it's one thing to have, say, you're telling that, okay, this thing about you is bad or this thing you did is wrong. But it's like if somebody is questioning your existence itself. So, yeah, your question, existence as a devotee itself is a problem. So then, then there's a lot of hostility and bringing that hostility down takes time. Now, to some extent, you, you brought that down with respect to that person who asked the question, Brahmacharya, you asked the question about the Gita. Right. But, but what I have noticed is that sometimes when I, I try to do that, the effort doesn't seem to be worth it. Because it's yeah, just like, that's right. it's just like, there's so much difference. There are so many mountains, to literally mountains to be crossed. Yeah. And there has to be some level of Foundational agreement. Yeah, and uh, it's, a really, it's a really good point. Really. So point. you know, so I, I, you know, I was contemplating the eighteen twenty and eighteen twenty two. What you talked about earlier, you know, focusing yeah. only on a part as a whole and seeing integrally. Right. So I That's feel right. for, for criticism to move toward dialogue, there has to be first accepting and then challenging. But yeah. if first challenging, and then maybe you come to accepting then it's like first we build walls and then it becomes very difficult to take it forward. Yeah. There is a point of no return. And one has to know when to put it on the shelf for a while. And, uh, and then one has to, you know, and the thoughtful devotee will always reflect back and wonder, what could I have done to have made this better, a better outcome? Even mm -hmm. if the, the shortcut, even if the, it's the other party that refuses to come into dialogue, one still asks, what could I have done to make it even easier for this fearful devotee? They're fearful. They don't enter into dialogue because it's, it's, it's a fearful thing. They don't have enough courage or, or strength to enter into dialogue. So then the question is, what could I have done to make it easier for such a fearful person to come and enter into dialogue. So it's always a two-way thing, you know? Hmm. You know, sometimes they might, they don't at all seem fearful. They seem much more dismissive that oh, you are it, so it, yeah. wrong that you are yeah. not even worth having a dialogue yeah. with. Exactly. Like you say, you know, like in English, there is a saying that this is right and this is wrong. 
and that is not even wrong that's right so that's the that's that's re- that's thomas aguna and that's they they resort to that because they can't face their own lacking okay it's a cowardly assertion that i can't face my own shortcomings even if i'm if i have a lot that's right to offer to this devotee i still have to look at my shortcomings in not being able to coax that devotee into dialogue what la say look at my shortcomings too not into to to in, in, in terms of my inability to coax that devotee into dialogue coax okay coax okay yeah once, coax that once, okay. yeah once once i'm able to 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 make it viable or to somehow um uh to 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 give that devotee a sense that dialogue really is the way to go here mm. see as soon as there's no as soon as dialogue is gone there's no relationship no dialogue no relationship yeah no relationship isolation isolation no growth now and it's i mean it's not only no growth individually it's quite often when discussion stops then the bloodshed starts so oh, things then yes it becomes very acrimonious also yes then acrimony can set in yes exactly so exactly. yeah so that's why i put up the sign please criticize me i want to grow mm. so in a sense in the sign please criticize me itself is implicit in a what kind of criticism is sought of course we can't control what kind of criticism the other will give that's the point so someone will come forward with constructive criticism some will come forward and say guru you're just you know everything you're doing is ridiculous stupid it could be really outrageous right i'm ready for any criticism along that spectrum mm. as i did with that facebook thread but they wouldn't talk with me they wouldn't enter into dialogue with me beautiful so going back to that earlier point of like minded association so could we say that in general as devotees it's natural to seek like minded association and that's where we would be normally comfortable and that could be our home but we also need to be ready to periodically say come out of our home and associate with unlike minded devotees also so yes. to broaden our conceptions of bhakti yes if you're constantly with unlike minded association then that will also make us very unstable and insecure it like we ne- we don't have any home to go to at all yes and other is we just never go out of home yes mm. precisely yes true thank you and uh, i was thinking about this point of no return you know that even prabhupad when he started iskon he wanted many of his god brothers to be involved he got his disciples to meet them associate with them and then he in fact wanted a, like a committee to be formed to over to run iskon also yeah so in many ways he wanted them to be involved now no of again no offense to them they are all great souls in their own way yes. but when prabhupad saw that they were becoming possessive and they were trying to pull his disciples then maybe that was the time when their dialogue not with everyone but with some of them prabhupad stopped it and with some of some of the other god brothers he always had very warm interactions yes hmm. i was there for some of them oh really okay yes the i was there we went to cross the uh, river in uh to go to nabadweep to shridhar uh maharaj's ashram oh okay so i was right there i was sitting right there listening to the dialogue back and forth between shridhar maharaj and uh, it was having a amazing experience to see prabhupad in that mood you know that prabhupad mostly like a mood of acharya teaching yes hmm yeah but i knew at that time i, I knew no bangla oh okay and they were talking bangla amazing yeah but you could see the reactions and the you know the facial expressions and the body language and and so on so that was always 
you know, just the darshan, just the darshan was wonderful. Uh, with great souls. That's always amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so do you think has... we've covered our topic today reasonably? Yes. I mean, yes, bro, quite comprehensively. It's yeah, nice that we. Want, you can criticize. You can criticize if you want. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe I. I, I was, I said, a little uncomfortable with the point of criticism, as I said earlier, but I'm, my concerns are fully addressed. Yeah. And yeah it is, okay, good. So good. maybe I'll try to summarize. We did go a lot of journey. I'm yeah. not sure, but let me try. Yes. So our topic was, you know, say, please criticize me. I want to grow. And then basically we started with how in the academic world, there are reviews and the whole reviews idea is criticizing. And then through the criticism, the man manuscript becomes better. And if you if you want to learn, then I also shared my experience in, that I learned a lot by the writing of the BTG articles. And then you talked about the uh, intent of the criticism, which, which is important, and how it is phrased, and also the receptivity of the person who is receiving it. So the receptivity is important. And then we went into the discussion of how uh, the mood of questioning is if it is suppressed, then it will come off as gossip. It won't go away. So if uh, if somebody is uh, somebody is having some reservations, best to address them. And you give the example of the Brahmachari asking this question about you are writing a commentary on the Gita. And uh, so basically, if you you appreciated the question, you are not defensive, and then you address the question. So. Uh, now, when we are actually going to get this kind of criticism, it's a, it's important to see that not as an attack, but as an opportunity for dialogue. And yeah. when we, when then, in fact, Arjuna himself is criticized by Krishna. Arjuna, very funny, you said, Krishna did go to Bhishma and say, Arjuna is in Maya. So <laughs> that is beautiful. So. So here criticism is uh, now, in a sense, when you see somebody doing something wrong, we want to stop them from doing that. Or if especially if they're doing something wrong, which is going to hurt others, then for those who are being hurt, you have to stand up to them. So when I give the example of a uh, parents not fighting in, in front of their children, but you give the counter example that if a, if a parent is abusive, then the other parent needs to stand up in front of the children to put, uh, against that abusive parent. Right. So we have a responsibility. What is Sanskrit word is Shastra Raksha. We have that responsibility to protect the scripture. And we do that in a, by, by asking questions. So criticism in the, in the mainstream society has that sense of negativity of denigrating and condemning and uh, so that, but in the academic sense, it's more of analyzing for improving. So we are talking about criticizing in that sense. And in our tradition also, we can have criticism in the sense of pariprashnina, questioning. Yeah. So questioning leads to deeper understanding. Yeah. And any, any questioning, pari, yeah. could have just been prashna, prashnena, but it's pariprashna. Oh, okay. Pariprashnina. Thorough question. Beautiful. Upasarga, Upasarga mm. the pari, pari, pari yes. means any questioning. Any question? Yeah. So then, uh, you talked about also, you know, Prabhupada himself. He encouraged questions, and uh, we have in our tradition. So they, we came into the example of a seesaw. So where there is the whole point is, we if we are to have a dialogue, we cannot avoid having uncomfortable issues being discussed. Otherwise, it stays super superficial. And uh, so when we have those discussions, then. Uh, we, if we present ourselves not as omniscient, but as wanting to learn, then quite often, and then people do soften and the dialogue can happen. Yeah. But, and then you also made the point that when there is, there is criticism, we don't say bring Prabhupada as the first, Prabhupada quote as the first line of a defense, because then that present, prevents the heart to heart human or devotional connection. So we authentically, can, we don't borrow from authority, but we build our authenticity and then we can also bring in authority. And yes. that same obstruction of connection can also happen if we are too much fearful of Vaishnava Aparad, because yes. we may 
not offer criticism or even when we apologize we may do it uh, we may do it more for for the fear of vaishnava aparad not for preventing for preventing the damage to the relationship or repairing the damage to the relationship yes and then in that seesaw example it's uh, like the example for that gita and the bhagavatam we could say they are more like undergrad or preliminary student level discussion so it's more of vertical but the chaitanya charitamrita is more of reciprocation yes. Yes. so it's so the person up at one level is more vulnerable yes and um, that vulnerability in bhakti can be also be seen from rupa goswami's quote that taking risks in bhakti that risk is not like uh, living on the edge sports or something like that yes it is it is bearing our heart and inviting criticism inviting feedback and then so after discussing about the receptivity because that's how we will learn then we talk went to the other side about uh, what is the mood while giving criticism so we have to uh, at one level we don't want to hurt anyone but we don't want to be paranoid about vishnu aparad and if we find that we have hurt anyone we okay, i apologize for hurting your sentiments at the same time if the we feel the issue is important we can stand by the issue but we are ready to ex- maybe change the way we express ourselves so we we are cognizant of the other person's emotions or the impact of our action on their emotions at the same time if we have a cause to stand for we stand for it and uh, when we if we actually damage someone or hurt someone then simply for asking for forgiveness is self centered we have to actually make amends so if i burn my if i burn your house and uh, then i say i'm sorry so if i crit- if say if x y z criticizes you to some devotees and then comes and apologizes to you the amending is actually apologizing and clarifying with them yeah so that way we fix things and then toward the end we discussed about prabhupad example also of how prabhupad had is you said is although you couldn't understand the language but you saw the warm reciprocation between him and shridhar maharaj yeah. and in ultimately The, if the fear of that was a brilliant example that just as the, the fear of the offense to the holy name is not meant to make us stop chanting similarly the fear of vishnu aparad is not meant to make us uh, stop connecting with devotees yeah. and while connection is happening this is a point earlier but we came back to it a little later also that there is the speaker's capacity and the audience receptivity and then the speaker can be uh, narrow minded open minded broad minded like kanishta madhyam uttama and same as the audience so the expert speaking will be that speaks at the broad minded level but also carries on people at other levels carries together rather people at the lower levels and yeah. then you give the example of how arjuna when krishna says in 1872 that have you heard with one pointed attention that means krishna is keeping his focus on that one point of getting arjuna to the level of uh, becoming aware of how much krishna loves him and how much krishna is with him yes. and while addressing various diverse arguments yes. so if we also can do that that is the that is the expertise of a of a uttama a uttama yes. bhakta and so the uttama bhakta is basic you talk about kanishtha not just as a devotional categories but as broadly human categories and then we have the example of these christians that sometimes we have dialogue with people who we don't have dialogue with the people who are who with whom who actually need that dialogue right so then we need to have to come out of our safe zone yeah. so that is also an example of you taking a risk when you went and uh, gave a hug to that uh, that bird. bulky <laughs> what did you say over qualified for football it's <laughs> a <laughs> uh, so um, so when we do that that kind of uh, connect when the connection happens then that is what actually brings uh, fulfillment to a devotee's life yeah. and we so we can we we would naturally like to be with like minded devotees because that can be our home but we also need to come out of our home and periodically associate with unlike minded devotees so that we can grow and we can maybe we can help them also grow yes. so now please criticize me <laughs> <laughs> that was well done. I have to say that was a an excellent summary and um 
if if I'm able to share my screen, I can show you the picture. Oh, please, that is lovely. So you see it? <laughs> That's trust Jesus. Okay, yeah. so it really looks, as you said, scary. It's very scary. You see that, Noah? So did you also have a discussion with him eventually, or it was just a hug and? I, I did. I did talk to him. Yeah. Oh, okay. And 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 you know, we. It, 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 I mean, again, dialogue. It's. I mean, I mean, would you ever think of dialoguing with anyone like that? I mean, look at that. I mean, would you go up to someone like that? I mean, it's a little yes. imposing, isn't it? Oh, definitely. So, yeah. I think you made that very beautiful point also. When you know how to dialogue, then you are you 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 don't have fear, because right. you can approach. Yeah. That's right. That's right. True. Beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, thank well, as you. as always, Chaitanya Charan, I've really enjoyed our dialogue. Yes, sir. And so, uh, it's been really fun. Really, uh, uh, and uh, again, meaningful to me. I've learned things from you. And um, I look forward to some more of some oh, more. Oh, I would dialogue. love to have, continue the discussion. Through. It is so illuminating, so inspiring. I would say three things. It like at an intellectual level, it broadens conception so much. Yeah. At a devotional level, I feel that in my first and our first discussion, also I appreciated you know that that in you the head and the, the head doesn't compromise the heart. So we have the devotional depth that also comes in, and also I feel that there is just a, a the third thing would be that we bring in real life experiences. So it's not just like a emotion of the heart or just That's like right. intellectual conceptions. We are actually discussing real life situations and bringing real life experiences. So I feel it has have a huge, huge, it has a relevance to the audience also. So yeah. thank you very much for sparing your time, and I look forward to continuing the discussion soon in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Chaitanya Charanji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.